So Amy Bowsey has been with the Iowa Department of Agricultural and Land Stewardship for 24 years, the past 12 years working with the Urban Conservation Program. Amy works throughout Eastern Iowa, assisting municipalities, homeowners, private industry, and nonprofit organizations with urban runoff and water quality issues. Her presentation will share information on how Eastern Iowa homeowners, municipalities, businesses, and nonprofit groups are using a variety of funding sources to incorporate urban practices on their properties, including REAP, Urban Water Quality Initiative, sponsored project funding, and a low interest loan program through the state revolving fund. Rain gardens, soil quality restoration, native landscaping, permeable pavement, rainwater harvesting, and storm water wetlands will also be discussed. So welcome, Amy, and thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. I'm going to talk about funding urban practices in urban areas. And the main focus of today, for my talk anyway, is to just focus on those practices and the funding sources, if you live in town, if you live in a rural subdivision, if you have a business, uh, if you're a municipality, um, the whole focus of this funding is to improve water quality and reduce flooding. And so just to put that in perspective, I wanted to share real quickly just a few slides on, on why we're trying so hard with this funding to put these practices on the ground. Uh, if we could travel back in time and look at Iowa, as the land, saver, land surveyors did as they first came across the state, we'd obviously see a much different land use. Uh, Iowa was prairie, and that's the yellow on this map. The other main color that you see are the green, where our forest lands. Today, obviously, that looks a lot different. Where we have the prairie, now we have the gray, and that is row crop production. Iowa is, is about 10% urban, so the bulk of the state is ag. Uh, but one of the things that we're finding with water quality and flood reduction is that in our urban areas, uh, the water obviously, it, it comes a lot faster and there's not as much ground for that water to soak in. And so what we're trying to do with this funding source is try to mimic some of those soil conditions, some of the Iowa's ability to absorb the water as it used to be. We estimate that, that Iowa used to be able to easily absorb a six inch rain and today we have trouble with an, with an inch of rain. And that's just simply because we had such amazing, incredible topsoil that could soak in that water. Um, one of the other challenges that we see today is that the way we design our, our communities, um, in particular, we try to, to get that water as fast away from our, our houses and our streets. For good reason, because we don't want to have flooding in our houses, we don't want to have flooding of our streets. Um, but one of the challenges of that is that we tend to, to take that raindrop as soon as it hits our roof, have it go into a gutter, go into a downspout. And a lot of times those downspouts are directly connected into our storm sewer or that's directly um, set up to be able to send that water to the streets. And so that makes a huge challenge when we're coming up with water quality and flood control issues. Uh, just to put this in perspective, even a small urban lot like the picture that you see here can contribute a significant amount of runoff. And when we look at this site, uh, there are many different funding opportunities that are out there to be able to address that roof, to be able to address that driveway, to be able to address the compacted yard. And so in just one inch of rain, just one inch, this small lot could have 4,000 gallons of water flowing off of it. So our funding is set up to try and mimic what Iowa used to be able to do in terms of with its soil and with its land use to be able to use our current land uses to be able to address water quality and flooding. There are four main funding sources that we work with today to, to really get at the urban issues. Uh, the first one that I'm gonna talk about is REAP funding or Resource Enhancement and Protection Funding. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about a loan program that's out there. Then finally, the last two bullets on here, the Urban Water Quality Initiative and Sponsored Project Dollars, those are specifically set up for large-scale municipal projects. This first funding source, REAP, um, this is specifically for if you're a homeowner, if you're a business, if you're a nonprofit, for example, a church or another, uh, another group. Um, this funding is really for you. 
uh, cities and schools, uh, any unit of government, they're not eligible for this particular funding. This funding is best suited if you have a, a small stormwater project on your property. For example, maybe you wanna do a rain garden or maybe you wanna improve the health of your soil or, or maybe you wanna establish native plantings to, to attract pollinators. This is the funding that you wanna take a serious look at the funding is available through each of the soil and water conservation districts uh, in the state of Iowa. Every county has a, one soil and water conservation district. And so it's a locally led source of funding. And each district can handle that, their funding as they see fit. So some counties are gonna have different priorities in terms of whether they fund urban or whether they fund ag. Uh, but it is an option for any urban homeowner to get funding through this program. The first type of practice that we see used a lot with this funding is restoring the health of a soil. In our urban areas, uh, we seem to have significant issues with very compacted subsoil, very compacted soil that makes it difficult to act as a sponge. And so with the soil quality restoration funding, we're able to come in um, on existing yards and do a deep tine aeration and then apply compost over the top of it. Um, you're lucky in the Davenport area that if you're from Scott County or you're close by, Davenport has a really good source of compost. And so it's easy to be able to have that delivered or to be able to use. On the yards, we're seeing it either applied with a spreader like here, or we're seeing it blown on. And one of the things that you see with these pictures is that you can still see the grass poking through. So this is a really good uh, practice that can be done on existing yards to improve the health of the soil. This is a picture from the Quad City area where on the left, there was soil quality restoration done on the fall. And on the right, there wasn't any. And this is a picture in the early spring. So you can see that not only does this help with soil health, but it also helps to give your yard a, a good jump start in terms of greening up in the spring. The second practice that I want to talk a lot about is rain gardens. Um, these are another practice that we see used a lot with REAP dollars. Um, a rain garden is simply, it's a form of landscaping that is depressional. They're set up to take water from the downspout on your roof or maybe a couple of downspouts on your roof. These depressional areas, they're, they're backfilled in with an amended soil. There's a mulch layer and then there's native plants on top. And the whole purpose is to direct the water from your roof, uh, from your driveway if it works, uh, to be able to let that water soak in, let it get treated before it runs off downstream. Here's an example of a residential rain garden that was funded with REAP. And here's one that was done uh, at a business. So we're seeing, we're starting to see more and more uh, of the private sector in terms of businesses incorporate these practices. Another practice that we see used a lot with REAP funding is permeable pavement. Many of our urban areas are dominated with roads, with driveways, with parking lots, with alleys, and incorporating permeable pavement is one way that we can really see huge uh, water quality and flood reduction benefits. As you can see here, the, um, this is a system using a paver block. The blocks themselves are not permeable, but there's gaps in between each of the, the blocks that allow the water to soak in. And then it, underneath those blocks, there's lots of layers of rock, and then there's an emergency tile. We see permeable pavement used in driveways, and this is funded through REAP. Uh, we also see them in patios, and this happens to be a backyard patio. Uh, we also are seeing local businesses use this. And so this is the brewery that has featured their outdoor, all their outdoor seating is on top of permeable paver material. The last practice I wanna cover for REAP is native landscaping. Um, we're seeing a huge interest in native landscaping, um, especially to attract the pollinators and so native landscaping is a practice that you can get funding for under REAP. 
just to give you a little example on how REAP works, um, if your property happens to be in Scott County, um, Scott County will give you 50%, uh, they'll match your project cost 50% up to $2,000. So if you have a project that costs $3,000, 50% of that would be 1,500. 1,500 is less than 2,000, so 1,500, you would be eligible for $1,500 on a $3,000 project. Another example is, let's say you have a project that's $5,000. Half of that would be $2,500, but you're eligible for $2,000, since $2,000 is the max in Scott County. Now, keep in mind that each county in the state of Iowa is different in terms of what their, uh, what their cost share is that they give. Um, it typically is around 50%. If you're interested in getting funding and you're in Scott County, I would contact Jan McClurg. I believe Jan is on the call today. Um, I've listed her email here. I've also listed an example of Scott County's cost share application. You can see that it's pretty simple, you know, name, address, information, a little bit about the project. Uh, if you happen to be located in another Iowa County, you're gonna submit uh, a request or an application to the conservation assistant at this that at that particular office and i've listed below here in this bullet here you can see a website where you can track down all of the conservation assistants and secretaries where you would get that information for next steps for reap um, just to keep in mind once you submit your application it does have to be approved by the soil and water conservation district commissioners before you start uh, we take a look at the site we look at the project plans and checklist. Our whole goal is to make sure that anything that's funded meets uh, design standards. And so we are working with the contractors before construction. We're stopping out periodically during construction. And we are taking a look at site just to give a quick certification once it's done. And so that's the REAP program. If, once again, if you're a homeowner, business, you have a small project you want to tackle, that is the funding source that you want to take a look at. Uh, one program that I think is little known in the state, um, although we're seeing um, some amazing projects be done with it, we just want to get the word out about it, is the Stormwater Low Interest Loan Program. This is not an outright cash match. Uh, it is a loan. But with this funding, you can borrow up to $500,000 for the design and the installation of stormwater practices. So there's a lot of money there to be able to, excuse me, there's a lot of money there to be able to borrow to be able to put these practices in the ground. There's typically a 20 year loan and you get to work with a local bank and the Iowa Finance Authority. The minimum loan is $5,000. Um, the eligible applicants, so if you're a homeowner, business, nonprofit, if you're a developer, if you're a municipality, this program is open up to about everybody. You submit an application. I've got the web link at the bottom of the page. Um, and then there is a design process as well, a design review process and periodic construction observation. Um, here's just a few pictures of some of the different practices that we funded with the stormwater loan program. Um, this is a large streetscape project that's taking water from the street and funneling it into uh, a bioretention cell, streetscape bioretention cells. Um, this was a project that was done with a local developer in terms of uh, native plantings, stormwater wetlands, and ponds. Uh, we also have had uh, one project where we worked with a developer on large scale uh, soil quality restoration for an entire development. So uh, what they ended up doing with this particular development is, is bar borrowing money and then coming in to do deep, do deep tillage and then incorporate topsoil and or compost. And so this was one way to really restore the health of the soil on a very large development scale level. Um, the practices for the stormwater loan um, are all across the board, ones that are in the stormwater management manual. So the ones I talked about earlier with REAP, those are eligible as well. The last two types of funding that I want to talk about um, 
the urban water quality initiative funding and the sponsored project dollars, these are more catered towards municipalities. And so if you're a homeowner or a business owner, um, it may be possible to partner with the municipality, but the municipality really needs to be the entity that applies. For urban water quality initiative funds, um, it is a competitive process. There are typically um, 30 or so applications that we get each year and only about 10 each year get funded. So it's, it's really competitive. Um, it is, there is a pre-proposal and a full proposal that, that's required. Uh, you can receive up to $100,000 though. And so that's where it, it makes sense to, to have um, a, a little bit more involvement there. Um, a 50% match is required. So in other words, um, you need a $200,000 project to get up to $100,000. And, and then typically we see an educational component with these water quality initiative projects. Uh, at the bottom of the page, there is a link showing uh, how to get to the current proposal that we have out right now. So just to give you a sense of some of the different projects that have been funded with the Urban Water Quality Initiative, uh, Josh Balk, who you're going to listen to a little bit later today, uh, he worked on this project in the Cedar Falls area. This is an elementary school. This uh, elementary school wanted to address the runoff from their parking lot and their buildings, and so the water is funneled to the islands. Uh, normally, these would be raised islands in a traditional parking lot, but in this parking lot, there's depressional islands, and it takes the water from the from the parking lot, it comes in here, it's treated in bioretention cells. And it, it's really quite amazing in terms of how this is, is integrated at an elementary school. Another project, this is permeable parking. If you've been to Cole College in Cedar Rapids, this is right by their football stadium. All of the parking stalls you can see are a different color here. Those are all permeable pavement. All the parking lanes are traditional surface. The drive lanes drain, every drive lane, every bit of impervious surface in this parking lot drains to permeable parking stalls. And that water then just soaks right into the ground. And then from a flood control standpoint, um, we don't have that water running off. If you've ever been to the Amana colonies, or if you haven't, this might be a chance to go and visit. Uh, this is the site, it was just completed this fall. We just had the grand opening. This is the former Amana uh, Woolen Mill area. Uh, it's been restored. The inside of the building's been restored to a 65 room hotel. Um, it, it's really quite amazing to see all the restoration work that went in into the old mill site and now it's set up for hotel rooms. Um, not only did they use sustainable practices inside the building, but outside as well. And you can see um, the, the red permeable pavement that matches the brick on the old building. All, this entire parking lot, everything drains to permeable pavement. And then you can see in the, in the lower right hand corner, uh, not only is there permeable pavement on the site, but there's also a very large bioretention cell that takes a lot of the runoff. And you can see that a fire truck's watering these newly established plants right now. One of the other things that was important to the Amana colonies on this project is that not only did they address the surface water, but they also took a look at the native plantings and trying to bring back some of those natives that would have originally been on the site. Um, and so this site has an, a really an enormous amount of plantings all along the board, along the borders of the building. These are uh, these windows that you see here, those are all hotel rooms that look out on the native plantings. Muscatine, which is uh, not too far away from the Quad Cities, this was the project where they did uh, quite an extensive bioretention cell and permeable pavement project um, in their city hall parking lot. And this picture is about one year old. And what's amazing is that, is that not only does all the water from the parking lot drain into permeable pavement and then drain into the bioretention cells, but when I was out there in September to see the number of monarchs that were on these plants, if you just take a step back and you look at all the surrounding areas, there's pretty much just hardscape and pervious surface, rooftops and parking lots. And it was amazing to find this source of plantings that uh, the monarchs found so quickly um, to be able to, to have as a source of, of food. And so I think this is a great example of not only addressing water quality, flood reduction, but also bringing back habitat for, for the pollinators. 
Uh, another project that we've seen funded with the Urban Water Quality Initiative funds um, are bioswales. And this was a project that was funded um, in the Cedar Rapids area, uh, in particular in Knoll Ridge Park. Uh, Knoll Ridge Park is known for its beautiful gardens, more formal traditional gardens. Um, they are working to try to get more and more pollinator habitat in the park. And they also wanted to incorporate some sustainable ways of uh, addressing stormwater. And so uh, this was a bioswale that was used to address water as well as bring back some of the native plantings. The last uh, type of funding that I want to talk about is uh, sponsored project funding. Um, this is very competitive as well. Um, it's specifically catered towards communities that are upgrading uh, wastewater systems. And so that might seem like a, a little bit of a strange nexus, but if you have a community that's going to be upgrading a wastewater system and they're going to be borrowing money from the Iowa Finance Authority to finance those improvements, then they get to compete for this money. And basically what the communities are competing for is, is to reduce the interest rate on that loan. So anytime that you pay interest, anytime you get a loan, you typically pay interest. What happens with the state on this uh, low interest uh, sponsored project dollars is that you act, the communities that are successful, excuse me, successful, actually get to have their interest rate reduced. So they pay less interest and that money that they would have paid in interest actually gets to go towards water quality improvements within their community. And so some examples of this funding being used are uh, some Green Alley projects in the cities of Dubuque and Clinton. Uh, Dubuque has, has really done uh, a tremendous job at retrofitting their alleys with permeable pavement to address enormous amounts of impervious surface. Um, one of the practices that we haven't talked about yet um, is bringing back street trees, bringing back trees for stormwater management. And these are some silva cells that were constructed in the city of Clinton. Um, if you've been in the Lyons District along Main Street, they've done a lot of work over the years to install stormwater practices to separate uh, a combined sewer system. And so one of the things they wanted to do here was to bring back healthy street trees. One of the problems that we have with trees in urban areas is that sometimes they don't thrive very well. They often, they don't have a good root system. They, they, the trees don't, they, the roots don't have a chance to be able to expand. And what these silva cell units do is allow the, um, the space for the roots to be able to move laterally. And so the, um, there's excavation that's done, the silva cell units are put in, and then they're backfilled in with a soil, and then there's tree plantings, and then the tree roots get to spread out. And so here's an example of the completed project of, with silva cells. The silva cells are underneath these permeable sidewalks. Here are the street trees. So you, the water that falls on the sidewalks waters the, the roots of the trees. Then you also have the um, silva cells and permeable sidewalk connected to on-street parking. So the water from the street flows into the permeable pavement, street water is treated, and then any excess water can help with the, tree, uh, the management of the trees. Uh, one other type of practice that we see used with these sponsored project dollars are green roofs. This is a project in Coralville that was recently completed. Um, you can see, uh, how tall some of these buildings are. And rather than looking out on a, on a roof that's just plain roof, it, they look out over onto these green plantings. Um, this is the site of um, the arena in uh, Coralville, the new arena that's in. Another practice that we see on a large scale level that's funded with sponsored project dollars, as well as urban water quality initiative dollars are stormwater wetlands. Um, you may not think that, uh, well, I'll take a step back. The stormwater wetlands are probably one of the more effective ways that we can handle large amounts of water. And so this particular wetland actually treats two thirds of a small town in Bremer County. And it's pretty amazing that with this one practice, we can treat uh, roughly 90 acres of drainage 
and it, it really is making a difference in terms of water quality and reduction of flooding. The last practice that I want to talk about is stream bank stabilization. We are seeing a lot of communities use sponsored project dollars to address eroding streams. And this is a project that was done in Dubuque County along Catfish Creek. Um, I guess I do have one more project and that I wanted to focus on. And this is actually one that was funded with Jeff Geertz and the uh, Iowa Economic Development Authority's funding. Uh, this is the project that uh, use rainwater harvesting to and, and combination of rain gardens to address stormwater runoff. And so what happens is on this on these buildings, the water comes down from the roof, comes down into the downspout, goes into cisterns, and then anything that discharges flows into a series of connected rain gardens. And so we also are starting to slowly see the use of rainwater harvesting and reuse of water in the state of Iowa. The last thing that I wanted to talk about today, and this is just my, this is my last slide, is the opportunities and challenges that we're seeing with some of this funding now. Um, there are a wide variety of funding sources available. And in my 30 years of working with water quality, this is the most amount of funding that we have ever had. It's, it's really, really exciting. Uh, I think everybody in the state understands the importance of these practices. They understand the, the commitment and the need for this funding, and so that's why, why it's there. Um, the second thing is that the private sector now has the capacity to be able to help with the design and the installation of these practices. So there are a lot of private contractors out there now that are starting to do these projects that have experience with these projects. Um, the third thing is that we have the materials locally in the state. Oh. For instance, for the compost that you would use for soil quality restoration or for bioretention cells or rain gardens. If you're in the Quad Cities, you can go right to the Davenport landfill and get the compost or they can deliver it to the site. So we have the, the materials now in many different areas in the state to be able to, to incorporate these practices, to do these practices. Native plants, we have native plant dealers in the state of Iowa. We have local nurseries that are starting to, to have these native plants that are available. And so all those things really make it easier to install these practices. Um, the last two points that I, I do wanna leave you with is that um, there's a lot of funding, there's a lot of people out there doing the work, um, but we do need to be careful in the sense that there are design, design standards out there to follow. And we can set these practices up to fail if we don't follow the design standards. And so we have checklists for the designs, we have checklists for the construction to help make sure that at the end of the day when everything's done, there are projects that are installed that meet design and installation standards. And not only are there resources in the forms of, of checklists, but we also, you know, we're available to answer questions, to provide training, to, to be on site one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, whether it's just talking one-on-one -on -one or, or formal presentations through the Iowa Stormwater Education Program through partners. There are a lot of different ways to really get out the details and how this works. Um, so with that, um, my last slide is just simply a few of the practices, uh, a few more practices that I hadn't talked about that are, that are installed across the state of Iowa. But, but once again, um, if you are interested in, in doing some of these practices, um, this is the time from a funding perspective. So with that, Cassie, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, also, I just wanted to point out, um, Kathy Morris at the Waste Commission wanted to let everyone know that the compost is available at the Davenport Compost Facility um, near the Mississippi on the west side of Davenport, not at the landfill. Oh, um, th thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so um, Kay is asking, is freeze and thaw an issue with permeable pavers? Good question. So we are seeing uh, a lot of permeable pavement uh, being used across the state, especially in the northern parts of the state. Uh, the nice thing about permeable pavement in terms of traditional service is that you have some, some room to take that, that freeze and thaw. And so uh, 
we've, we are having good luck with using uh, the permeable pavement in conditions, um, in our extreme Iowa weather conditions. And so I'm not concerned about the free stall. Okay, thanks. Um, Gina asked for the various permeable pavement projects, has there been maintenance, in, it's kind of a similar question, maintenance issues related to snow removal, salt application and silting into the spaces between the pavers? Yeah, great question. So with any of these practices, there's maintenance. Um, they are set up, uh, you can do standard snow removal. We have some communities that will actually, if they're pushing snow, they'll have a rubber tip blade um, so that they don't uh, impact the, the, the pavers. We have some communities where they use just a standard blade, but they're really careful in terms of pushing on the surface. Uh, in terms of annual maintenance, um, large scale permeable applications, uh, they do need to be uh, used a vac truck, so they need to be vacuumed. So any of that uh, material that might get deposited during the spring or during the winter months, that needs to be picked up in the spring. Um, these particular, the pavers are not suited for sand. And so communities have to make a decision on how they're gonna do ice treatment. Sand is not something that we're gonna recommend on, the, on these pavers. And so we look at a variety of different, um, communities are, are looking at a variety of different ways to de-ice. On a small scale permeable pavement project like a driveway, um, you can use a shop vac, you can use a leaf blower. So there are a variety of ways that you can treat and maintain these pavers based on the overall size of the project that you have. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve is asking, can you give a sense of how Scott County compares to other counties in Iowa in terms of the usage of grants you mentioned? Yeah, so back to the sponsored project um, application, we've seen quite a lot of Scott County communities that have participated. I think Davenport has participated multiple times. Um, the city of, of, um, of, of Eldridge uh, has, a, has a new application. Um, I believe I saw Zach Howell on the, on the call. He's working with that community. Um, Parkview is a community. Uh, in Scott County that also has a, as a new application and I believe Zach might be working on that one as well. So I think that from a large scale project for sponsored projects, we've seen several communities participate on water quality initiatives. Uh, Davenport uh, has been active on, a, on a, and the Soil and Water Conservation District has been active on, on several WQI projects. Um, and then in terms of the, the cost share from homeowners, uh, Scott County has a soil and water has a very active uh, cost share program where many homeowners have participated in getting that funding. So uh, I think we've had a lot of good participation and I think there's more funding there to do a lot more projects. So um, I, I think that there's a good trend on, on doing a lot of work. Okay, thank you. Um, Adriana um, also asked if this is um, a program that's more appropriate for um, native planting maintenance after insulation? Yeah, good, good question. So what we've seen probably, I think the best example of establishment and maintenance for native plantings is the, the sponsored project dollars. With those dollars, we can actually, we actually have several examples of communities that have set up a one to two to three year establishment program after the natives have been established. And so I think that's probably the best example of where communities have been able to utilize the funding to help get through those first initial years of establishment. 